Dr. Graham Hill is a criminologist and former senior investigating officer with the Surrey Police. During his career, Graham worked to solve some of the UK's most high-profile and infamous crimes, including the murder of Millie Dowler and the London night stalker Delroy Grant. Someone has to be in charge. Someone has to bring the investigation towards its ultimate conclusion. Graham, who specialises in child abduction and murder, assisted the Portuguese police in the investigation into the disappearance of Madeleine McCann. In this series, he's using his own insider knowledge and expertise to unpack the investigation from the inside out. The public only ever sees the tip of the iceberg. I want to tell the full story and reveal how detectives brought a series of elusive killers to justice. This is Murder Detective. East Ham, London is a vibrant multicultural community where different ethnic groups by and large live in harmony together. East Ham, it had been a, a very working class area up to about that time. You then get waves of immigrant communities coming in from Eastern Europe, uh, from Asia. But these communities were very much isolated. They kept themselves to themselves, very often not even speaking English. So whatever was going on, whatever crime may have been going on within those communities, it usually didn't spill out onto the native community, as it were, uh, of East London. East End of London has always been a working class area, and in part you could even describe it as a deprived area. It was, um, you know, I think um, it had, had its problems. Every area, all over this lovely country of ours, you'll have that, where the vast majority of people are wonderful and, and you know, deserve to be looked after, and there'll be a group of people who are preying on them. East Ham was no different. In early 2004, tensions in the area exploded into terrifying violence. Graham Hill is in East Ham to revisit the circumstances surrounding a seemingly random and vicious attack. On the night of the 12th of January that year, police received a call about a young man being viciously attacked on Higham Road. Police sped to the scene, as you would expect, and they found a man lying in the road. He'd clearly been beaten savagely. From the beginning, they could see that there was multiple wounds and multiple series of different types of weapons. Um, very quickly, they found out that cricket bats had been involved and sticks and bars and even reports of a hammer and a sword. This was a savage attack by any standards. He wasn't dead. So it's being investigated as a grievous bodily harm, as an attempted murder. So the preservation of his life, the preservation of his health, has to take precedence over evidence. And that has to be managed very carefully. The medical team has to do a number of medical procedures to try and save that person's life. And sometimes that can influence and complicate the forensic examination because you've got clothing on the victim that might give information and clues. And also you've got injuries on the body that you would want to try and see at the earliest opportunity. But clearly the medical treatment the person is getting takes priority. The very first portal call would have been the uniform officers that are working in the area and their immediate task would be to seal the scene, to preserve witnesses, to see if the cordons were in the right place, to start the initial inquiries, is to make sure that at the very initial investigation that is being dealt with in a professional way. There were people taking other people aside, quiet words here and there. There was intimidation going on, which is the hallmark of a gang involvement in this shocking attack. The situation was 
quite difficult at the beginning because there was lots of bystanders and what became very clear is that there was a bit of a whispering campaign going on in the crowd. While the investigation team started to gather evidence, the victim, Maheshwaran Kanishan, or Mahesh, was fighting for his life. Because of the severe injury, his head was broken in six places, and there was a brain swell, and uh, the doctors in the hospital tried to do whatever they can to keep him alive. While his heart was beating, and while his lungs were providing his body with oxygen, the damage to his brain meant that he was essentially brain dead. Three days after the vicious attack, Maheshwaran Kanishan was pronounced dead. The case for grievous bodily harm became one of murder. The minute that Mahesh dies, the Metropolitan Police deem the incident a Category A murder. A Category A murder is where the offender is unknown and there is a considerable community impact as a result of the murder. I'm on my way to see former Detective Chief Inspector Clive Driscoll. As an SIO, Clive has been involved in some of Britain's most high-profile murder investigations. Clive, how did you first learn about the murder? I learned about the murder when I, I got a phone call. I was at home from uh, Mr Briggs, who was my chief superintendent. My team actually only did historical murders, that's what we were doing. And he suddenly announced that because of the high level of murders they'd had in this area, that we were going to help out the murder team. First, the investigation team needed to learn more about Maheshwaran Kanishan, a Sri Lankan emigrant who was living in the UK. He was a poor fisherman with a poor family, a very basic standard of living. But his village was within an area that was controlled by the Tamil Tigers, which was a separatist Tamil organisation which was fighting a 20 or 30 year civil war with the Sri Lankan authorities. This was a, a dangerous situation for him and his family. And he was offered the opportunity to come to this country illegally, to start a new life when he could send money back to his impoverished family. This seemed, on the face of it, a good idea. He paid money to an organised gang who brought him to the UK, promised him a better life, promised him that he'd get work, when in fact what he found himself was in debt bondage to the gang. He was working every day of the week for about a pound a day. They paid such low money that they can never ever afford to pay off their debt. The debt accumulates on its interest, compound interest, so it's a, it's a never-ending nightmare for these people. Detectives retraced Maheshwaran's steps in the hours before the attack. Maheshwaran went to this restaurant called Priya Restaurant, which is on the High Street North in East Ham, and they met his friends, and they all probably had dinner and, um, you know, chatting with each other and having a good time. They left the restaurant just before midnight to walk home. The three of them walked down Higham Road and then one of the friends went down a side road and Mahesh and his friend continued down Higham Road. They were both attacked by a number of men. His friend ran away and Mahesh was caught and beaten by the men in the street. There were three cars involved. Um, I think probably four or five of them in each cars who were waiting for the, the victim. The severity of the attack is what really shocked the community because it's, you know, several people attacking one man with bats and sticks. It was a new level of vicious violence that er had erupted on the streets of East London, something that we hadn't reported before, that we hadn't known about until then. How quickly did it become apparent to you that this was going to be quite a complex investigation? Almost immediately, really, because 
when we were talking. First of all, you know, I don't speak Tamil, and so that was going to be a challenge. Secondly, you had witnesses that probably wouldn't normally wish to speak to police because they could have been here illegally themselves. And I assume there was a lot of consideration about the community impact of the investigation. Yeah, there was. Um, seeing somebody butchered on the streets, it does have a massive impact on the community, it undermines their safety. And indeed, there had been quite a few incidents of gang-related attacks involving people that had come from Sri Lanka. So it just heightened the anxiety that people had in the area. In East Ham, the community was shocked by the fact that the attack on Mahesh appeared to be random. For Clive Driscoll and his homicide team, it was clear that this was a complex case. And most importantly, the attackers were still at large. Former Detective Chief Superintendent Graham Hill is in the East End of London to find out more about the attack on 26-year-old Sri Lankan native Maheshwaran Kanishan, who was viciously beaten to death in January of 2004. Graham has been granted insider access to this case via the senior investigating officer, retired DCI Clive Driscoll. Clive was assigned to the case the day after the attack and made his way directly to the crime scene. Now, that must have been quite difficult, picking up the pieces of someone else's investigation, trying to understand how they dealt with the scene on the night and trying to understand what was done. It caused many problems because, one, you're, you're chasing people, aren't you? You're trying to find people, what notes they made. You want to make sure that you've got all the notes. And, and you know, yourself, police officers, can be sometimes not evasive for the wrong reason, but they're busy and they're somewhere else. So we actually adopted the attitude as if it had just happened. We started widening our cordons and started searching in different areas, searching for CCTV and the escape route that the uh, suspects used, whilst trying to gather what they'd done on the night. Clive needed assistance and was fortunate enough to enlist the help of a detective who knew local Tamil customs and language. A key member of Clive Driscoll's team was a Sri Lankan himself. He was a detective sergeant, his name was Rama, and he was absolutely crucial in getting on side locals in Sri Lanka and helping with um, persuading the Sri Lankan authorities to make the effort to find these two men. Clive got in touch with me um, uh, and um, asked me to help in this investigation because of a I was, uh, I am a Tamil speaker, I know the community, and I got involved a few weeks later um, during the investigation. I was born in Battersea, what would I know about Sri Lanka? What would I really know about the Tamil Tigers? You know, I mean, so I needed some, what would I know about the culture of Sengalese, the Tamil, the difficulties? I wouldn't know any of that. So I wanted someone who could tell me that. So I went looking for Rama, and by quite how lucky was I? You know, he was truly outstanding. We did a, what's called an anniversary visit the following week when we almost set up what was happening again so that we, the police, could see, but also anybody would jolt memories of, well, actually, I remember that. I do remember these people walking down. So it's really to relive it and uh, making sure that you're getting every bit of information you can and not missing anything, really. The anniversary visit revealed some vital information about three vehicles that had been used in the crime. It was a blue Ford and a gold Mercedes, and then there is a light color Mercedes as well. The people who live across the street, um, some of them took uh, the details of the Mercedes, mainly the, the gold one, and uh, they pass it on to the, the police. Detectives were able to corroborate the witness descriptions using CCTV from the surrounding area. We knew that that was the, the route that they took because we were lucky enough with CCTV and phone records and everything which would allow us to pinpoint where the vehicles were going. So you're looking really along that route and, and 
it is about, you know, it's just sometimes it's simple as that side, look that side, yeah. where could they have thrown the weapons? And we did find weapons up here. So you're looking as hard as you can, give yourself the best possible chance. One key piece of evidence recovered on the night of the murder showed the true ferocity of the attack. The cricket bat used to attack the victim, broke in four pieces and fell on the ground. So they recovered the cricket bat and some forensics came out from the cricket bat. The cricket bat revealed a bloody fingerprint, but the identity of the assailant remained unknown. As the SIO, Clive is required to record and document the key decisions he makes during the course of an investigation. This is known as policy. I have a phrase that says, if it wasn't written down, it wasn't done. Uh, and policy, we know, is really important. And I think it's very important, because you are absolutely right. That's the law. You've just quoted the law. If it ain't written down, it ain't happened, does it? You know? And so I think don't give them the opportunity you're saying, well, you say that now, didn't you? That's what you're saying now, but you didn't say that back. No, I did, actually. There you go. If yeah, you want to, if hindsight's you want to... an exact science, isn't it? Yeah. When I... they start criticising yeah. you 18 months after you made yeah. the decision. And that policy is your safety net, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's come out of... that. You know, that has come out of where we haven't had a safety net and where... Go back in, you know, back in time, where that's what I did. You know, yeah. that, that's what I thought. That's how I did it. The police were aware of issues with Sri Lankan Tamil gangs who were operating in East Ham at the time. Well, in the early 2000s, there was an increasing issue with Tamil tiger oriented gangs in this country, not just in the East End, not even just in London, which just showed uh, the power and the capacity to intimidate and create fear. They were all from the Tamil part of Sri Lanka, and they'd almost brought the tribal attitude towards different parts with them. And it is all about organised crime. I mean, it, it's about this is our area, so all of the crime that goes on that area is ours. And, and they were incredibly violent and incredibly um, ruthless. Police discovered it was the same Tamil Tiger gang who had brought Mahesh to so-called safety from the Sri Lankan war zone. The gangs were very secretive and they kept themselves to themselves. So there was this isolation and the gangs fed on that isolation. You can't go out to the indigenous community because they're not your people. We are your people, you stick with us. And that's how it begins. But then that evolves into, if people who don't necessarily go along with it, intimidation and then threats. And those protection teams then become the street gangs that, that try to hold the communities in place. You try and cross them at your peril. We did quite a lot of inquiries around the agency that he worked for, how he got here. It certainly gave us an insight of why this may have happened, but it also gave us an insight on the suspects and how the suspects were joined to him, how the Sussex formed part of his life just prior to him being murdered. As detectives interviewed family and friends and associates of Mahesh, it became apparent that he was attempting to clear his debt to the gang in order to free himself. Mahesh was working seven days a week for very little money, and he knew someone that worked at a local petrol station, and that person offered him a job. He took the job for considerable more money, but unfortunately what that did is upset the people that bought into the UK, and they saw it as an insult, and they saw it as something that they needed to correct very quickly. They weren't just going to say, oh, well, that's, these things happen and, uh, and walk away. They are going to exact a bloody revenge, not only against Mahesh, but also to show the others, the other slaves, that they can't break away. They could not let this lie. They had to take action, and they were prepared to kill. Nobody could penetrate their community, uh, not the media, not us, we couldn't penetrate it, and also not the police, because 
immediately after the attack in 2004, it was difficult to find witnesses. Nobody would talk. The Great Wall of Silence, which led to a long and protracted police investigation. Now, there's an interesting development when you were interviewing one of the witnesses that sort of gives a good indication of the type and the level of intimidation that some of these witnesses were experiencing. Absolutely. Greg, on the anniversary visit, when we were talking to a witness who was there at the time, is with um, Makesh, um, his phone rang and somebody has obviously tipped him off saying that this witness was speaking to the police and he made threats. And not only in this country, they had family members in Sri Lanka, so who could be threatened, you know, and that could be a way of getting at them. So yeah, we, we had to make sure that we were very focused on the victims and what their needs were to allow them to come forward and do the valuable part in the criminal justice system. The great success of Clive Driscoll's police inquiry was that he broke the wall of silence early on. Clive Driscoll and his uh, team were able to convince Sri Lankans and Tamils community in East Ham that they could trust the police. Three of the suspects were identified. The gang leader, Siva Jodi Anand Taraja, Siva Pragasam Rajas Khanna, and a third man known as Siva Lingam Siva Kumar. There was always the worry that they would flee to Sri Lanka once we realised the type of, you know, incident we were dealing with. So it was it was trying to ascertain where they were, and so we were really trying to speed up, almost with the fear that they were fleeing from us. Anonymous sources reveal the suspects were already making moves to flee back to Sri Lanka. For Clive and his team, it was a race against time. The investigation had just become global. Graham Hill is in the East End of London with Clive Driscoll, the SIO who investigated the murder of 26-year-old Mahesh Warren Kanishan in January 2004. Members of a notorious Sri Lankan organization, the Tamil Tigers, had been connected to the murder, but sources revealed they were trying to flee the UK. A getaway car registered to one of the suspects had been identified at the scene of Mahesh's killing. The gold Mercedes number plate was taken by the witnesses from Higham Road uh, given to the police and so the police has the, the, the car registration number and then they trace the owner of the car as Sivalingam Sivakuma. But Sivalingam Sivakuma went into hiding so he moved his address. He was in London and he had friends in Hertfordshire and various parts so he was moving all over the place was incredible. He, he knew that he would be caught if he went through airports because of the high security at airports, Heathrow or, or Gatwick, wherever you're flying from, and even arriving in Sri Lanka. You've got cameras everywhere. And so he loads up his car with his, uh, all his worldly possessions and he, and he thinks, well, like the tortoise, I'll go slow and they won't catch me because I'll be under the radar. Police were hot on Siva Kumar's trail, and it wasn't long before they tracked him down. With the first of their suspects in custody, detectives found the evidence of the attack in his car. Some of the really damning forensic evidence was found in the gold Mercedes car. In that car, Mahesh's blood was found, and fragments of the cricket bat were also found. So there was a definite link between that car, the person driving that car, and the attack. Siva Kumar was brought before a judge at the Central Criminal Court in London. First of all, the police had to put Siva Kumar, the one suspect they had in their hand, on trial. And at the Old Bailey, uh, about a year after the uh, murder, uh, he went on trial. He had refused to, to give any uh, help to police. He, he made no comment interviews throughout, put forward 
very little defence in a positive way, other than it wasn't me. Uh, but the, the, the uh, evidence was too strong, the jury saw straight through his lies, and he was jailed uh, for the minimum of 17 years. Although Siva Kumar was behind bars, police needed to track down the two other gang leaders, Anand Taraja and Rajas Khanna. They quickly disappeared from their home addresses. They were moving from one place to the other. And then we uh, discovered uh, later on when we uh, spoke to other witnesses and family and friends of the, the suspects, especially the victim's family in Udapu in Sri Lanka, and the people in the village saw them. So we knew that they have fled the country, fled UK, gone back to Sri Lanka. One of the real outstanding things about this investigation is Clive Driscoll's dedication to the cause. He decided that actually there was two outstanding offenders and he wasn't going to give up. So he had to persuade the hierarchy within the Metropolitan Police, he had to persuade the Crown Prosecution Service, he had to convince the Foreign and Commonwealth Office that this was a legitimate thing to do and that this was the right thing to do. I'm guessing you were going to have to justify to your bosses why you thought it was important for them to be extradited and why you thought it was important to keep this investigation alive. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the battles you had there? The answer is you have to do what you think is right for the family. So you have to sort of go in and demand within your power that you are supported. But also, to be fair to the senior management team, explain why you believe that that is, you know. And, and for me, it was quite simple, really. Are we honestly going to allow people to kill people on the streets of this country and then all they have to do is go away and leave us. So my message is quite simple, don't do it because we will continue to come after you and we did and that you know was a very strong message I think. Tracking down criminals in a foreign jurisdiction requires that a country operates within an internationally recognised framework. When a UK police force wants to do work in another country, they have to speak to the Foreign and Commonwealth Office and they have to get what's called letters of authority to work in that particular country. Also, the information has to go via Interpol because Interpol have connections in every country. So Interpol is a group of people that can mediate between different police forces and help police forces operate in different countries around the world. International arrest warrants were issued and Clive Driscoll flew to Sri Lanka to pursue the, uh, these two ringleaders. Not only was there an ongoing civil war in Sri Lanka, the country was also in turmoil after a tsunami hit its shores in December 2004. One of the problems that Clive faced was that Sri Lanka was still suffering the after effects of a tsunami. And therefore there was lots of displaced people, lots of people where were in places that they shouldn't be. And so he found it very difficult to work in those conditions. Clive and Rama flew to Colombo, the capital of Sri Lanka, and drove 65 miles north to the village of Udapu, where they met Maheshwaran's family. We had about a two-hour drive, and then we go into this village, which is just on the seafront. And, you know, it is a poor village. And I was shown to a house which didn't have electricity. And you had mum living there, the two brothers living there. The family informed the detectives that the two suspects had been seen hiding out near the village. The suspects who fled to Sri Lanka First, they tried to bribe the brothers. The elderly brother was approached by Anand Raja himself. The brother asked him what happened, what was his involvement, and Anand Raja told him that uh, he was not involved in the murder of his brother, the victim Maheshwaran. Anand Raja tried to give some money to Maheshwaran's brother. If he helped him, to eliminate him from this investigation, 
and paint him as an innocent party not involved in the murder. Clive spoke about people trying to intimidate him, trying to stop him conducting his investigation in Sri Lanka. So that was significant, and that's something we see with a lot of organised criminal gangs. They try and intimidate everybody, sometimes even the police. Back in London, Detective Rama used his influence in the Sri Lankan community to explore potential leads. They had information coming from people that had friends and family back in Sri Lanka. They found out that the two suspects that had fled the country were going to a family wedding in that area on a particular day. I was told by the villagers that Anandaraja would come to this wedding and uh, that was the opportunity to arrest him. And then I informed the Sri Lankan police uh, this information and then Sri Lankan police went to the uh, location and they were waiting, uh, but Anand Raja didn't show up. Probably uh, Anand Raja knew that he will be arrested if he show up. Both suspects were still at large and the gang leaders were aware the police were trying to arrest them. Clive and his team were at an impasse. The trail appeared to have gone cold and it would be several years before they finally had their next major break in the case. Former Detective Chief Superintendent Graham Hill is revisiting the case of the murder of 26-year-old Sri Lankan native Maheshwaran Kanishan. He's been learning about the investigation from the man who led it, retired DCI Clive Driscoll. Three years after the first visit to Sri Lanka in 2004, Clive received news that the Sri Lankan police were closing in on one of the suspects. The first one they were able to pick up was Roger Skarna. He was in an isolated uh, house outside the village, which the police were able to surround. Roger Skarna was playing cart, and when he approached him, Roger Skarna tried to run away, and uh, he shot, uh, fired some shot on the air and told him to stop. Fortunately, the police were able to outnumber him, and they were able to arrest this key lieutenant. Uh, and absolute key suspect in the murder. Soon after the news had broken that Rajas Khanna was in custody in Sri Lanka, Clive received a surprising phone call while travelling on the tube. It was the gang leader, Anand Taraja, offering to turn himself in. Bizarre as that, really, sitting on a tube at Putney Bridge Station with a phone call and somebody who I've circulated arrest for murder phoning me up. How are you doing? Oh, fine. Would you come over here, please? So why did Atharaja give himself up? One suggestion is that he suspected that now that his lieutenant had been arrested, that the local police would just cut the loss and say, well, we might as well shoot the other one rather than give him to the British police to take back to London. More likely the suggestion is that he was convinced that his power in East Ham was still intact and no witnesses would come forward to identify him so that the case against him would collapse and he would now be a free man. Both suspects were held in custody in Sri Lanka for the next two years before being flown back to the UK to face justice. Can you explain a little bit about the process when the two suspects were extradited and arrived back in the UK. With extradition, you have to have your case prepared. When they come to this country, they're just going to go to court. You can't sit down and do a PACE interview with them. So you have to make sure that you can show this authority is here and the authorities in Sri Lanka, they're going to court for the offence of murder in this case. So in effect, your file's ready to go. Everything's yes, ready to go. Absolutely ready, yeah. Suspects were brought to trial at the Old Bailey in May 2009. We reported at the time that two men who had 
been traced to the Tamil-held areas of Sri Lanka, were finally now in the dock at the Old Bailey to answer a charge of murder from East Ham back to 2004. That was five years earlier, so it was a long trail. And the media story we ran was the long arm of the law finally catches up with the perpetrators. They didn't want to stay in Sri Lanka in the Sri Lankan system. They wanted to come over here into the British system. But just generally, I don't know if they had a lack of respect for our system or just generally thought they could bribe people, I don't know. But they didn't seem to think the outcome would be the outcome. The mental psyche of these people is, well, you know, I'm a member of a street gang, I'm one of the East End, the East Ham boys, nobody's going to talk against me. These witnesses are not going to show up for the court case. I will bluff my way through it. That's the hope, but it wasn't like that because between 2004 and 2009, the Tamil community, or the Sri Lanka community rather, in East Ham was becoming more and more integrated. So the passage of five years brings them closer into the community and less afraid of their own street gangs. And that was the downfall of these people. So it took you five years to get the two guys you extradited from Sri Lanka, yeah. to get them to court. Uh, you get to court and you're thinking about presenting your case. Were there any particular difficulties in stuff you had to say at court and things you had to show? It was closely liaison with the Crown Prosecution Service and, and the lead barrister and uh, the junior barrister. But above all, to, to just not lose focus on the evidence you've got. You know, make sure that you're explaining, well, hang on, we've got this, we've got this. Yeah, because no one knows more about the job than the SIO. Yeah, absolutely and right. so when the SIO sits down with the lead barrister, you're almost sort of schooling them on the key points and let them present it in their way, aren't you? And you would know, barristers sometimes, Friday night, don't know, they pick up a brief under yeah. that, that bow they've got on it yeah. and read it and, and usually they present it very well but I do believe you have an onus, yeah. you have a responsibility to say hang on, we've got this and we've got this mm -hmm. and this is you know what we've done, yeah. well, there's leave the that to flow. them. I, yeah. There's the ebb and flow with all trials isn't it, you have yeah. good days, you have bad days yeah. but ultimately it's about the decision at the end. Dot the I's, cross the T's is what I used to say, make sure you have the answers for the obvious questions that they're going to ask you that you can prove your case. One of the things that Clive and his team had to do is they had to maintain very good relationships with the Sri Lankan community in East Ham, to the point where they protected people from intimidation and they were able to get witnesses to court that gave crucial evidence that led to these convictions. Witness after witness came to court to point out these were the men at the scene of the crime and back up all this mountain of forensic evidence that the prosecution had against both men. What the pathologist presents in this case is the record of how many separate injuries this person has. The pathologists point out that there were injuries consistent with a hammer, consistent with a cricket bat, but then the evidence from the forensic science will come in to say whose DNA was on that implement, on that weapon, whose blood is on that weapon. And those two pieces of evidence together allow the jury to decide that that weapon caused that injury and that person used it. The jury concluded that, beyond a reasonable doubt, these individuals caused those injuries and caused Mahesh's death and were held responsible for it. Sentences are quite harsh. They both get life. One gets life with a recommendation of 24 years minimum. So he's obviously still behind bars. The other one gets 14 years. So he's probably due out shortly. These were harsh sentences, but they were designed basically to send a message that, you know, you commit murder, you may flee, you may go abroad, but we'll pursue you. We're not going to let you go. And when we do bring you back, you will be tried before a court of law and you will get the penalty you deserve. We cannot do what their family really want. They want their loved one back. Let's do the next best thing. Let's do the next best thing. Let's do the best job we can do for them. Their son had 
gone to Britain to make a life for himself, and suddenly he gets murdered. They needed justice, and they get it when all three of his killers end up behind bars. It won't bring him back, but it does draw a line under it for them. They can now grieve. They have their son buried back home in Sri Lanka. They can visit the grave, knowing that the, the men who put him there have been dealt their justice. Clive's leadership skills and passion to get justice are a testament to the hard work SIO does to solve a case. One of the things that SIOs have to do is they have to lead, and they have to lead from the front. And in this particular investigation, Clive had to have lots of different strategies running. He had lots of staff working on this murder, and he had to keep them motivated over a long period of time. What he also had to do was use a lot of different techniques to problem solve. And he did that very, very successfully. The role of the SIO is lead investigator, but also its chief motivator. When you're running an investigation that lasts five years, how did you keep the team motivated and on track? I believe it's about um, being respectful to your team while still staying a little way back because somebody has to be the, the chief inspector, don't they? But above all, just making sure that everyone knows it's a team. Best advice I was ever given was by a superintendent who said, Clive, you won't change the world. Make sure you're part of the world. It's as good as it can be. Be good at what you do when you do it. Yeah, just do what you do. As you, that's a cracking phrase, actually, to the best of your ability. I was very proud of the team and the hard work they put in for the arrests of these suspects. All the detectives and the senior management and the, on the whole as a police, we worked very hard to, to get justice for the family. I think one of the important things about this particular case is it sends a really powerful message. And that message is that if you come to the UK and you commit murder, no matter where you go, the police will hunt you down, they will find you, they will extradite you back to the UK, and if the evidence is there, you will stand trial and you will be convicted of that murder.